Ian here from Backroad Buddies, and the video we want to share with you today is about a detailed comparison between our old rig and our new rig. So our Van Duet camper van, four-year-old camper van, and our new Winnebago Echo. Now this is not a comparison between all Echoes and all Van Duet camper vans because you can get different options, different layouts. And these are also four years apart, so they're, it's not quite a comparable comparison, but we just, it's what we know, so we thought we'd, we'd do a, share a comparison of it, and hopefully you find it useful. Now this is a deep dive, so it's a rather long video, so if there are particular items you want, are interested in, in learning about, then you can look in the description below. I list out a timeline with each of the numbered items that I talk about. So you can jump around or just watch part of it and come back and watch the rest of it, whatever you want to do. So let's dive right in. Item one is class B versus class C. Now, if you know the RV classifications, our van do it camper van is considered a class B because it is built on a van and from the outside it still looks like a van so all of the conversion happens inside the shell. And then the Winnebago Echo which is also built on a Ford Transit but it's built on what's called a cutaway chassis. So the front may look like a Ford Transit but everything behind the cab is built by Winnebago so it looks like a box. It doesn't look like a van anymore. Now that enables a lot of things. You have straighter walls, which are easily to deal with. That also gives gains you a lot more space up near the ceiling because you've got square walls instead of the camper van, which kind of curves in. And it also allows you to do a tighter, for them to build a tighter shell with better insulation because they have control over all the walls. They're not trying to shove insulation into the nooks and crannies of the van that Ford created. Now, as I said before, both of these rigs are built on a Ford Transit. Now, our Van Duet camper van was built on a 2018 Ford Transit with a 3.7 liter engine, not the EcoBoost. And it only has rear wheel drive. Our Echo, on the other hand, is built on a 2022 Ford Transit and it's the extended length. Our camper van was the mid length. The Echo is an extended length and it also has the dually wheels in the back. Now this is the camper van cab driver's seat. Now we really like the Ford Transits. We find them comfortable. I have really long legs so the Ford Transit fits me well. It, I've sat in a Dodge Ram before and I, there's no way I was going to drive that. This is an older Ford Transit, like I said, so it doesn't quite have all the bells and whistles that the Echo has. And the thing we dislike the least is this little tiny, let's see if you can see it, this little tiny dash screen. And that's what we have for our, that's where our backup camera is. So it's really pretty small. Now this is the Echo driver's seat here, and so this has, like I said, a few more bells and whistles. One, of, I guess I need to put my seatbelt on. One of the things we really like, you can see it, is this huge screen, and this is our backup camera. So very large and nice. We really like that. I mean, it also has Apple CarPlay, so there's no need to mount our cell phones anymore up on the dash because everything, our navigation and, and music and everything is right through this screen here. So that's really nice. Another nice change that Ford Transit made was they made this, I think the handbrake is actually lower to begin with, but they also made it so while it's still engaged, it can be lowered. And so that allows the driver's seat to be rotated around. In our van, we can only rotate 
or swivel the passenger seat because it's too difficult to put a driver's seat swivel in with that handbrake in the way, but now they've allowed for that. And then another change that wasn't available four years ago is the transit now comes in all-wheel drive where all we could get on our van was rear-wheel drive. So it's not like we try to go down four-wheel drive roads, but every now and then you find yourself on a gravel or dirt road to get back to a campground or to a trailhead or to see something. I mean, we, we try to make sure we're always on two-wheel drive roads, but sometimes there's deep ruts and having all-wheel drive hopefully will help us um, be a little less likely to get stuck in some of these roads we end up on. So item three is the exterior dimensions. What we really love about our Van Duet camper van, it is small and nimble. We can get into most places other than drive throughs and most parking garages. But we can park in a normal parking spot. We can go just about anywhere. And so the Echo, although it is a little larger, it's not that much larger. So we're hoping it doesn't restrict us too much and would still allows us to be small and nimble. So it's our camper vans just under 20 feet and the Echo is has a length of 23 feet. And it's a little bit wider. The mirrors stick out a little bit. If you can find a parking spot, especially if you can hang over the curb or um, kind of borrow a little space from an adjacent spot, the Echo has no problem getting to a normal parking spot. Now, I'm a visual person, so I actually marked out the dimensions of both rigs on the ground here with tape. So that greenish yellow tape is the Echo and the blue is the van. And you'll see that when it's parked right up with the nose up against the curb, that actually both of them stick out. And this is kind of a very typical parking spot. And you'll also notice what's sticking out the sides there is the mirrors. So the echo mirrors actually are pretty tight in that spot. Now here you notice when we find a spot where we can overhang the front of the vehicle, both vehicles actually fit into this parking spot pretty well. The echo just hangs over a little bit. I believe the depth of these parking spots are like 18 feet, 10 inches or somewhere around there. So you can see when you can overhang on the front, you, it's pretty easy to get in a regular spot. Here you'll see if we can find a spot where we can overhang in the back, we even fit into a regular parking spot all that much easier. So we hope to still be just about as nimble as we were in the camper van. Item four, the interior dimensions. Now our camper van was basically limited by the dimensions of the camper van, but it was pretty much an open space. The Echo on the other hand is really kind of chopped up and even though it has a, a lot more room, it's kind of divided up into different areas. Now this is the camper van. Um, as you can see, it's a lot, it's very much open, although we do have it divided up because we have the queen size bed here and the cargo underneath in the gear slide. Our living space is really limited to this six foot by six foot area. But it is the high roof. Um, transit so I don't know if you can see I'm six foot we're both six foot so this gives us plenty of room to stand up change your clothes do whatever so it it doesn't feel cramped for being so tall the echo on the other hand is divided up into quite a few different living spaces the door here so you kind of have this dinette area here where you can work or eat and there's plenty of room for four people to sit unlike the camper van where there was only two seats basically 
Then you kind of have this galley kitchen area. And then bathroom. And then the bedroom. And so the gear garage or, you know, places where you want to throw your toys is actually accessed from outside. Although there are several compartments on the outside that you could use for storage and gear, the main one is the one here in the back. As you can see, this gear garage is quite roomy. There's room for two e-bikes or a kayak, um, not both at the same time, unfortunately, but it's quite a bit of space and it is heated and there is electricity back here. Item five is all the tank capacities. So in the camper van, we had a, well, in comparison, the Echo has a larger gas tank for one and larger freshwater tank, larger gray water tank. And it actually has a little bit of a black water tank because it has a cassette toilet. So in the camper van, our freshwater and gray water was stored in jerry cans, so about five and a half gallon jerry cans. So we had two fresh water, two gray water, and then we also carried two five gallon collapsible. And that could get us through three to four days. So now in the Echo, we have 50 gallons of fresh and 51 gallons of gray. So we're hoping that should last us close to 10 days. Now we also have a shower, so we may go through water a little faster than we did in the camper van. So time will tell. The gas tank is a little bit larger, but the Echo gets a little less um, gas mileage. So we actually did a little experiment on our drive back from California after picking up the Echo. So we were driving the same stretch of road, same weather conditions. Uh, we were alternating drivers and the Echo got about one mile per gallon less than the camper van did. So it's a little bit, little bit less efficient. Now the Echo also has propane on board, which we didn't have in the camper van. Uh, all our appliances either ran electric or our furnace ran off of the gasoline tank of the actual Ford chassis. In the Echo, we have now a propane stovetop in the kitchen that runs propane. Um, the water heater runs propane and the furnace runs off the propane. What we do like is that the Echo uses the regular propane tanks that you would use on your backyard grill. So you don't necessarily have to find some place that will fill propane for you, but you can go to, you know, any grocery store or gas station that does the tank exchanges and get your propane there. So it should make it a little more flexible and easy to fill up that propane. Item six, the electrical systems. So they're, both vehicles are pretty comparable on what types of systems they have. They both have solar on the roof. Um, they have lithium battery bank. They have an inverter charger. Um, and they can charge the batteries also off of the engine alternator. Now the difference being, of course, the Echo is bigger and better in most of those aspects. So instead, let me look at my numbers here. So instead of the 340 watts we had of solar on the camper van, we now have 455. And instead of the 315 amp hours of lithium, we now have a total of 640 amps. That's with the additional optional lithium battery that we got on the Echo. And however, the inverter charger is the same. It's a 2000 watt inverter charger. And then the Echo also has a second alternator on the engine just to charge the lithium batteries where on the camper van it was just the same alternator that the engine had was using. So it should, the lithium batteries in the Echo should charge faster with that second alternator. Now the electrical systems in the van were mostly located in this cabinet right here, which also served as a step up into the bed. So down here on the bottom 
is our three lithium batteries. And then in this compartment here, so this was our inverter charger controller. This was our solar controller and also the controller for um, charging the batteries from the alternator from the engine. And then the inverter charger. Actually around the back side here. So the inverter charger is down here on the bottom. And then a circuit breakers and fuses are back here as well. So here are all the controls for the electrical system. This is the inverter charger, and this is where you would turn it on and off. Um, and this is the solar controller. And I don't know if this one also controls the uh, charging from the alternator. It might, or that might be through the inverter charger. I don't know, actually, I'll have to look that one up. And then this will show us um, what our current charge is in our coach battery and our chassis battery. Now the actual inverter charger itself is located inside or underneath the dinette bench here. This was a design change on some of the older Echoes. This was actually located in the bay with the batteries and there was a pump here that would pump, help pump the gray water up into the tank because the tank sits higher than some of the gray water drains. So the lithium batteries are located in this outside compartment of the Echo and it's kind of hard to see but this is one large battery and there's another battery behind that and this is that pump that used to be under the dinette set which they swapped. The inverter used to be down here and they swapped the inverter and the pump around. The circuit breakers and fuses in the Echo are located here beneath the refrigerator. Let's see if I remember. So there they are there. Item seven is the bathroom. Well technically we didn't have a bathroom in the camper van. We carried an emergency camping toilet which was basically a folding stool with a hole cut out of the seat and we put a plastic bag in there along with some poo powder and called it a day. Uh, we didn't use that very often because it costs about a dollar each time by the time you consider the cost of the um, composting bags we used and the poo powder that we used. Uh, plus it's not all that eco-friendly. So and the Echo, we actually have a full-blown bathroom. So it has, well, we'll take a look at it. So, oh, turn on the light. So this is the bathroom. Now, the pink stuff there is we winterized this already. So that's what the, we need to wipe that up. So this has a sink, a mirror, medicine cabinet, a window. Um, this is a cassette toilet. And what we really like about this that is really somewhat innovative compared to other RVs is this swinging door. And then you have your shower. So by having this door and it snaps into place up there, it actually keeps the sink and toilet dry from the shower and there's a shower curtain that wraps around and then when you're done fold it back and now you don't even have wet walls around here so that's we really like the bathroom however <laughs> however that means that now we have a bathroom we have to clean which we the past four years for half of the year, we didn't have to clean any bathrooms. That was how the campgrounds would do that for us. Item eight is the kitchen. So this is the kitchen in our van, our Van Do It van. 
So we have a sink with a cutting board. We have a, I think it's a 2.3 cubic foot refrigerator with a little tiny freezer. About all that's really good for is making ice. It doesn't really keep ice cream hard. Um, and then, you know, cabinets to keep all of our items in, spice rack, that's our gray water down there. And our 700 watt microwave and counter space that needs to be cleaned um, <laughs> to work on. And then we also had a lagoon table that we could set up to give us additional workspace. What you notice missing is a cooktop. We did not use a cooktop inside. We either used an instant pot, an electric tea kettle, or we used our or the microwave, or we cooked outside on a single burner butane camping stove. Now this is the kitchen in the Echo. So again, we have a sink with a cutting board on the cover on the sink and a 900 watt microwave and a much larger fridge and um, we kind of have it turned off at the moment here's a view inside the fridge this is much larger than the one we have in the van and there's the freezer you could fit like half a gallon of ice cream in there <laughs> and we have a two burner propane stove if you notice that while you're cooking and you're cutting something up on the cutting board, there isn't much counter space left over to do anything else. So there is this lagoon table here that can be used while you're cooking. In addition, you have the dinette table that you can kind of stage things in as well. We're hoping the propane stove will come in handy on those days where it's bad weather outside and you don't want to cook outside. Um, we had in the van, we had the instant pot and the microwave, but it's still no substitute for having a stove top to be able to cook on. Mm. Item nine is the bedroom. So this is the bedroom in the Van Duet. This is a queen size mattress. So it is 60 by 80. Now, if you notice that the camper van sides kind of angle in, plus Keith has a set of uh, shelves on this side for his clothes so it felt a little narrower than a queen because the sides kind of closed us in a little bit but it was a very comfortable bed I think it's like a five inch memory foam mattress very comfortable I mean we do have to climb up and down there every night to get into bed and I stored my clothes in suitcases and had jackets up here so that normally meant we had to do the camper van shuffle and before we went to bed we had to pull that stuff down and then when we got up in the morning we had to put it back up on the bed in the echo the bedroom is actually a separate room there is a little privacy curtain that can be closed so this is a separate room there's nice cross ventilation with the windows now they call these twin twin beds but they're actually more of a cot size but if you, there's these two cushions you can put down and that will turn this into, actually I believe you have to have the drawers out to support it, but um, that actually turns this into a queen size running the other direction, so a 60 by 80. However, I'm not sure how you put sheets on this, <laughs> in this configuration, or how comfortable that would be because this doesn't have the uh, kind of the same support that you do under the two twin beds on the sides there. As I mentioned before, we're both six foot. So both of these beds, I believe are 76 inches. So they're very comfortable for six foot person to sleep in. Um, if you, however, I did notice if you are a stomach sleeper, you are kind of tight if you're six foot tall or taller, but you could 
flip this over and kind of go a little sideways or diagonal and get a little extra more space that way. But we find it comfortable just the way it is. Now we also like being able to sit up. That was one of the things we wanted. So we actually sit up this way. Other people say they kind of slouch down under the cabinets. That doesn't seem comfortable to us. But we do like being able to sit here. We can put our laptop there and both watch the same YouTube video or whatever. Item 10 is the dinette area. In the camper van, our dinette area, of course, is the basic living space where everything else is, like the kitchen and the bathroom and changing rooms for the bedroom. Now, as a dinette or a workspace, we use this lagoon table and it rotates around and we actually built this top so it expands out to four feet long. Let's see if I can get it out here. There's a support on the other one too. And so we can actually sit across from each other and have dinner on this long table. So it is our dinette. Or we can both work on the table at the same time. Or if just one of us needs a workspace, we can fold it up smaller. And pull it in and, and work on it right as a one-person desk. In the Echo, the dinette is a separate living space. So there's room for two adults on this side. There's, um, you can have it sit in the driver's seat or the passenger seat. Um, this nice dinette table folds up and down rather easily. And you can either use it as a workspace, you can both sit here and have dinner. If you both need a workspace, you can lower this lagoon table and the person in the passenger seat can use it as a desk. If you notice, there's also these cushions. Oh, I kind of box a Kleenex back there. But because if you notice, the floor is raised up a little bit in the living area. So the booster seats are to bring the seats up to a comfortable height. Item 11 is plumbing. Now both rigs have all their plumbing inside heated spaces. So in the Van Do It, since it's always, everything runs off of jerry cans, all the plumbing is inside the vehicle. So, and that is heated either by the S-Bar heater when we're camping and it's cold, or by the Ford passenger van heating ducts that run throughout the van when we're driving down the road. However, in the Echo, the spaces are only heated when you're camping because they have to have the furnace running to have those heat running through the heating ducts. There is no chassis heat running to the rest of the vehicle other than the front cab when you're driving down the road. So you have to be a little careful when you're driving around in freezing temperatures which is why when we were heading back from California after picking it up, there was a day where it was going to be below freezing most of the day. So we actually drained the water heater in the Echo to make sure it didn't freeze. Now the plumbing in the Echo is a little more complicated because instead of just jerry cans, we now have a large freshwater tank, a large gray water tank, and a little cassette toilet. So now we actually have to have sewer hoses to dump our gray, um, we actually bought the Americanizer that James from Fit RV uh, is selling that allows you to hook up the cassette to the sewer hose so it makes it easier for dumping into an RV dump drain as opposed to a public restroom, which you can also do with the cassette. So it's just more complex systems to uh, deal with, but the upside is we hopefully can go longer between dumping and filling because we have much larger capacity. Item 12 is the hot water and water pump. Now both rigs had water heaters and water pumps so the water heater in the van um, I think it held, let me look at my notes, is two and a half gallons of hot water. 
So that was plenty to do dishes, wash up at the sink. I even washed my hair at the sink and that was plenty. And it ran off of the AC power, off of the either the batteries or, or shore power if we were plugged in. In the Echo, the water heater is um, propane and it is a continuous hot water and it also has a recirculating pump so you can have instant hot water at the faucets so you're not wasting any water so essentially you have 50 gallons of hot water if you want to run through it all in a shower so hopefully we'll keep our water usage down comparable to what we did before but we'll see time will tell <laughs> item 13 is heating for heat in the van we installed what's called an s-bar heater and it actually runs off the gasoline right out of the gas tank in of the Ford Transit. So it's actually located underneath these shelves. It's located in this box and it has this one vent where the hot air comes out. So it keeps the person sitting here really toasty. The air actually, hot air rises, keeps us very toasty in the bed. This is the thermostat over here. We would normally set it down as low as it would go at night, so 57 degrees because of that heat rising, it would get rather warm up in the bed. And of course it wasn't quite so warm over here, so a lot of times we would use these DC fans to help circulate the air and even out the temperature within the living space. In the Echo, the furnace runs off of propane and is actually ducted. So. There's a heating duct down here in the floor. There's another one here in the galley kitchen. There's another one up below the dinette bench there. And so it circulates the heat throughout the coach. The controls for the furnace are located here. So you would, these are the controls actually for both the furnace and the water heater. It's warning me I don't have propane turned on, so it won't let me set the temperature. But anyway, that's how you would turn it on. Item 14 is air conditioning. Now, the both rigs have a rooftop air conditioner. In the van, the rooftop air conditioner is located right above the bed. So we'd kind of try to angle some of the vents so it wasn't blowing directly on us, but kept us nice and cool. Now we normally were needed to be plugged into shore power to run the air conditioner because it draws a lot of power and would drain our batteries rather rapidly. Now it, for circulation, the, now the person sitting under the bed didn't get much of that cool air because it was blocked and the person who benefited more was the one sitting in the passenger seat. So again, we would use the fans to help circulate. We actually could move this over here and help direct some of that air down to the person sitting below the bed. Here is the rooftop air conditioner in the Echo. Um, notice that it doesn't protrude down as far as the one in the van, but it sticks up higher on the roof. And like the furnace, this is also ducted. So there are ducts throughout the coach that distribute the air conditioning around the coach. And so we're hoping between that and the furnace that's ducted and the nice cross ventilation with the windows that we can open that we don't need any additional fans like we run in the uh, van. Item 15 is the entry door. Now for the van, the basic entry door was the big sliding door of the passenger van. You notice we did have a, we do have a running board that comes out automatically and closes when you open and close it. Um, this door is kind of big and heavy and loud. And so we try to minimize going in and out when we're at a campground late at night or early in the morning because we don't really want to disturb our neighbors. And if we're parked on a pretty good slope, this almost becomes dangerous because it's this is a manual door, it's not electric, so it is heavy and kind of hard to handle if you're on a slope.
and sometimes it doesn't close properly. The entry door on the Echo is a solid door. Well, it's actually two doors. So you have this solid door. It has two locks, each with a different key. And then inside is a screen door, which is a pretty heavy duty screen. And then there is also a step that retracts and comes out when you open and close the door, unless you have it locked. So right now, I have it in the locked position that we can, oops, we can turn that back on, maybe, there we go. So now when we close the door, those retract and they open. Now, I think this door is going to be a little bit to get something to get used to because it seems at least to us, a little more complicated than it needs to be. Let's lock those steps again. So I think it's more apparent when you're on the inside. So if you have the door, the solid door open and just, whoops, just have the screen, you notice there's no handle on the screen on the inside. So you have to open the slider and then open the screen. Now, if you have both of these, I'm assuming you would keep the slider open since you don't need to have it closed, but then you have to make sure that you do release the screen first and then open the door in order for the two doors to stick together. Kind of, they're kind of stuck together by magnets. If you do it the other order, then it gets really kind of weird and funky. In addition, it just seems like way too many keys and locks because there's also a key and lock for the screen door. In addition to the two locks on the solid door. Item 16 is windows. Now, because the van is built on a passenger van, we have windows all the way around. However, none of them open except for the windows in the doors of the cab. So since all those windows don't open, we actually use these window vents that go in the doors of the van. So they provide a secure way of Providing, and I have the wrong one. <laughs> Let's go over to the driver's side. Now we have one for each door, but I grabbed the wrong one. And now you get to listen to the bell. So this just slides into the opening. If I get it in there right. And then you just Close it like that. So now you have ventilation coming in and rain and bugs cannot get in. Now, when you don't want to see out the windows or you don't want people to see in or you want a little more insulation against the heat or cold, we actually have the Van Do It made window shades for all the windows and they just go in with magnets. So they're real easy to go in and come out. Now the Echo has just about as many windows as the van does. However, all of these open up and they open up to uh, two different positions. So you can open them up to there or even farther and you can even leave them cracked so there is a little gap there it might be hard to see so you can 
basically like we did the window vets in the van, you can leave the windows cracked open, get some ventilation, but yet be secure that someone's not getting into the van. In addition, you can have a bug screen that pulls down or a shade that goes up. Now, I don't know how insulating the shade is, but the windows themselves are double pane acrylic, so that should provide some insulation as well. Item 17, fans. Now this is the Max Air ceiling fan in the van. Both vehicles have the Max Air fan. This one actually is bi-directional, but to be fair, we normally only used it um, exhausting the air out. This also has a rain sensor, so if it detects moisture coming in, it'll actually automatically close. However, that didn't happen very often because ours actually sits below our sol solar panels. So it's really hard unless it's really windy and driving rain to get water to come in. In addition to the Max Air fan, which has multiple speeds, we have these little two DC fans that I mentioned before. Now these we normally leave at the foot of the bed and it has multiple speeds as well. And we can run those and blow those right on us if we're someplace where we are not with shore power and can't run the air conditioner. So that's kind of nice to be able to have that air flowing directly on us. Now this is the Max Air Fan in the Echo. This is only unidirectional, so it only exhausts air. Um, it does not have a rain sensor. However, it does have what's called a rain guard. So we'll have to see how well that keeps the rain out because this is not sitting below the solar panel. So it probably has a higher chance of rain getting in, but we'll see how that works. It also has a nice feature where you can kind of turn it on automatic. So if the temperature inside the coach gets above 78 degrees, it'll automatically turn on and help exhaust that heat out of the coach. Item 18, awnings. Now awnings are kind of a mixed bag. Some people like them, some people don't like them. Um, we like them when they come in handy, but a lot of times they don't. So we don't actually use them very often. Both of our rigs have carefree awnings on them, powered awnings. They are very sensitive to the wind. Our van did not have a wind sensor on it, but the Echo does. So if the awning detects too strong of winds, it'll automatically retract. And it also does not have supporting legs. It's unlike our um, the one on the van actually had support legs that you pull out and anchor to the ground. Um, we've had damage to our carefree awning on the van. Uh, one was we had a dust devil come through the campground and luckily Keith was right there and was able to grab the awning so it didn't go flying away, but it did shear some of the board, bolts off. So we had to get that fixed. And then the supporting legs, there was these plastic locking clamps that broke on us, but they were easy to replace. We were able to get replacement parts from Carefree. We also carry a moonshade. And a moonshade is pretty versatile. It doesn't, um, or it holds up against wind better than the carefree awnings do. However, it does take a little bit more work to set up, so it's not quite as convenient, but you can put it on whatever side of the van the sun is, which is why a lot of people don't like awnings, because half the time the sun's in the wrong direction, and the way you're angled or parked or your campsite, you can't, your awning's useless. Um, but there are times when there's like a light rain. Now awning, because it's attached right to the vehicle, you have protection from the rain. The moonshade, although you you attach it to the vehicle either via magnets or suction cups, we actually had some hooks in the luggage rack that we could hook into. And then it has kind of tent legs on the other side. So it sends up pretty similar to a tent, but kind of on a side of a vehicle. But there was kind of, it wasn't a good seal between the moonshade and the vehicle. So if you have a rain, you kind of have rain coming down in between there. But we don't normally like to set things up in the rain anyway, because we don't like to put things away wet. <laughs> so um, unless it's, you know, hot out and you know you have time to have it dry before you have to put it away. So 
we'll see this next season we're actually going to be camping in much warmer temperatures um, and we're going to try to stay at campgrounds for longer periods of time so we'll see how much we actually use it um, and, but we do plan on bringing the moonshade with us anyway because because of the issue of where the sun is and which side of the vehicle you want the awning on. We actually had a batwing. Winnebago Echo has an option for a batwing, which was a manual awning that's a little lower and is on the, actually is on the driver's side and actually rotates around to the back of the vehicle. So it gives you uh, kind of a much different area of of shade than the carefree awning and we wanted that so we're hoping at some point we can actually order that and have that installed later because it wasn't on the vehicle that we actually purchased. Item 19 is breaking camp. Now what we really love about the camper van was it was so easy to set up camp and then to break camp when we were getting ready to leave and it took about five minutes, 10 minutes max, depending what all we needed to do. And we're hoping the Echo will, we know it's gonna be a little bit longer, but we're hoping it'll still be in that nice, quick and easy setup and breakdown. In the camper van, breaking camp usually just meant a few items. We had a checklist to make sure we didn't forget anything, but it's mainly put the gear net up so things don't slide off the bed, make sure the fan's off, the other, systems if we have them on, the air conditioner or the heater are turned off. We usually turned off the inverter, although that's not a requirement. And we make sure, you know, the, the counter space is cleared off, everything's secured, the one drawer is locked, the cabinet, cabinet door is locked, the seat's turned around, and we pull in the mat from outside. And then we would go around and do a walk around on the outside and make sure the tires looked good, make sure the awning was put away properly. And then if we were plugged into shore power that that's put away. And then if we were on any leveling blocks that we get off of those and put those away. In the Echo, breaking camp is pretty similar, um, but there's just more of it mostly. Um, we have two seats to turn back around instead of one. We have um, a lot more cabinet doors and drawers to make sure they're secure. There's um, more counter space we may to, need to make sure is put away and secure. And then we also have to, you know, likewise turn off the systems. The, the uh, furnace, the air conditioner, we have to make sure the water heater's turned off and then go outside and turn the propane off. And then we have all these windows to make sure are closed. And that's probably, well, after we go around and kind of make sure they're closed, do a walk around like we did before. But now we've got all these exterior cabinet doors to make sure they are closed and locked in addition to the tires and the awning and making sure all the windows are closed. So we'll get to know that better once we get on the road and get into a routine and see how much longer it takes. We're hoping it's not too much longer. However, we are planning on staying at campgrounds just a little bit longer. Um, but that doesn't mean we won't be packing up almost just as often because that's the issue with a Class B or Class C RV is if you want to go somewhere and it's not walking distance or biking distance, you have to basically pack up and drive there, so whether it's a trailhead, going to the grocery store, or just going to see some sites. Now we're hoping with the e-bikes that we're going to take with us that our biking range will increase. So hopefully that will decrease the amount of times we have to actually pack up to go somewhere and we can ride our e-bikes instead. Item 20 is tires. So both rigs come with a full-size spare and the Echo has more tires to deal with because the back, if I don't know if you can see in there, 
is a dually. Now we've never owned a dually before, so it'll be interesting if there's some things we need to learn about that yet. Um, the things we've learned so far is, well, obviously it's now six tires to maintain and replace instead of just four, but we've already replaced our air compressor. So we have one now with a longer wand so we can reach in. You can see where the stem is for the inner tire. Item 21 is insulation. Now, we found that both of these rigs seem to be very well insulated. Um, we're assuming the Echo is a little better because they had full control over those walls and were able to not put nice, thick, insulated walls up. Um, the front cab is not insulated because that's done by Ford. So, in both rigs, we have a way of kind of isolating that cab off at night to keep heat loss or heat gain down. So um, Winnebago provided a nice insulating curtain that goes across the right behind the cab and we had a somewhat insulating curtain across our camper van as well. This is probably the best place on the door to see how thick those walls are and how thick the insulation would be in there. In the van we had installed these block out curtains across the back of the cab. It's uh, in addition to provide privacy, these are rather thick curtains and they actually provide quite a bit of insulation since that cab is not insulated. Um, and we usually close those at night and that really kept drafts down from coming in on a cold night especially and also helps keep the heat out if it's a hot um, but we're more likely to use it in the cold. Now this is the insulating curtain that Winnebago uh, provided and that just snaps into these snaps all around the back of the cab and it goes up fairly quickly not too bad. There's snaps down the side. And then if you forgot something, you left something up in the cab, you can use this zipper to reach up and and grab whatever you need and it does it it's a pretty nice thick insulated curtain so we like that item 22 is modularity and flexibility now this is where the van do it camper van really shines because it's built on 80 20 t-track so you can move things around easily you can reconfigure things the echo on the other hand is pretty much the layout is what it is. I mean, you can tweak it, but if you make changes to it, it's going to be more of a permanent nature where in Van Do It, you can move things around and move things back at uh, kind of almost at will. <laughs> so let's head over to the van and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is the 8020 T track I was talking about. If you notice, it is all over the van. Everything is built out of it that Van Do It put in, the electrical box. Um, the shelving, the gear slide, and what that allows you to do is there's, you know, accessories and parts you can put little eyelets on, you can, all different kinds of little gadgets, so these shelves are just in here with thumb screws, you can loosen them, move this shelf where you want it, you can move it back there, so you can kind of rearrange things that you want to. Um, the biggest advantage for us with this was this was our only vehicle, so in the summer we traveled with it like an RV, but in the winter we actually converted it back to a passenger van. So even though we built this kitchen pod, it's actually bolted into the wall in the back along a T-track in the back. So in about 30 minutes we can, this comes out in about three pieces, the top, the right cabinet, and the left cabinet where the fridge is. So we pull that out. We actually pull this plywood bench out. We pull the shelving out here down to the S-bar heater and the microwave. And then we have 
two um, bench seats that are original to the Ford passenger van that hook into the floor. So there's still the mount points down here in the floor for the bench seats. So we put, we have two two-person benches that we can put back in here. So that converts this into a six passenger van. Um, if we are doing work around the house and we need to haul building materials or landscaping materials, this is, rig is actually really nice to do that. We can put stuff on the gear slide. The gear slide helps us get stuff in and out. Um, we pull the mattress out. We can lay stuff and ratchet strap it to the bed platform. Um, so it's, it's great for hauling stuff around, hauling people around, and being our daily driver in the winter. Well, it's the modularity and flexibility, well, the flexibility that really is the biggest con for us because our camper van was our daily driver and we would park it in the driveway and that was our only vehicle. However, now, not only um, can we not really convert this into something that hauls a lot of, I mean, it does seat four, but it's too long to fit in our driveway. So that means we're gonna to have to put it in storage over the winter, which means we need to buy a second vehicle. So lots of money, but <laughs> that's the way it goes sometimes. Everything has its pros and cons. Item 23 is complexity. Now, as you probably gathered as we went through the other items that the Echo is more complex than our camper van is or was. So, that's another con for the Echo. However, we're glad we started out with the camper van and moved to the Echo because a lot of these systems, although the details of them are different and we now have some more systems to worry about, a lot of them are familiar to us. The concepts are familiar to us from water pumps to fresh water tanks, gray water tanks, black water tanks, um, solar, um, inverter chargers, and now we have the complexity of propane and probably the biggest, well, other than the addition of the propane, the other biggest complexity is the water system on the Echo. So the Echo's water system is a lot more complicated than just a few jerry cans that we fill and dump. So we've got, yeah, there's all kinds of configurations. You got to put the switches in. Now we've actually winterized already, um, but you know, different types of fill, whether you've got pressure or so this is the pressure fill, I think. Yeah, so we haven't done a whole lot of this already, but um, so you can do a gravity fill. Then you gotta set all the drains and valves properly. And then this is the gray water dump. So now we have to have a sewer hose. This is the Americanizer that um, James from Fit RV designed and is selling. So this allows that cassette to be hooked up to that water hose to make it easier to dump into an RV dump. So number 24 is price. As you can probably guess, the Echo cost us a lot more money than the Van Dua camper van did. So the initial price of both, the Echo was about twice the price of what we paid for our initial Van Dua. Now to be fair, that's four years apart. This is a larger vehicle, so it's the extended with the dually wheels. And we also made some modifications to Van Duet since that initial purchase. So we built our own kitchen pod. We um, upgraded our refrigerator to a little bit larger than what originally came our initial purchase. Um, we installed the S-Bar heater ourselves. I'm trying to think. And we upgraded the AGM batteries to lithium. So we did some expenses on there and that double price isn't <laughs> accounting for those. So if you would compare Van Do It Van, oh, that was the other thing that saved us money. When we got our Van Do It, at that time they were, they would do conversions on used vans. So we actually had a one year old used Ford Transit passenger van that they converted for us. So that saved us a lot of money as well. I don't believe they do that anymore. They just have too much volume to 
and so they only do new. So if you compared the two of them today, buying a brand new Van Duet with the same, you know, extended length and uh, maybe some different options and made them a little more comparable, the price difference probably wouldn't be as great. But from what we initially paid, yes, it was significantly more for the Echo. So there you have it. Um, kind of the conclusion is they're both great rigs. We love both of them. Had the Echo been around four years ago when we were purchasing our Van Duet, we still would have bought the Van Duet um, because that met our needs at the time. It met our budget at the time. Um, but then now, four years later, we want a little more comfort and we have the finances to do it. So today, the Echo makes more sense for us. So which one is best for you? That's up for you to decide what your priorities are, how you travel, how often you travel, what your finances are. So hopefully this video provides you some insight in a nice comparison between the two. So thanks for watching. And if you want more details and some helpful, useful links, look in the description below. There's a link to our related blog posts, so check that out. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. We'd really appreciate that. Ta-ta for now.